What's going on, Lions fans? Welcome to the Pride of Detroit YouTube channel. I'm Miko, once again joined by my guy Morgan here. And Morgan, so far this week, we've already done all of our basic film study on the, you know, on the Buccaneers, talked about the offense, talked about what dangers they present and present as well as some opportunities that the Lions have to take advantage of that group. We also took our time and talked about the defense and broke down, again, just what makes that defense so tough to deal with um, if you're, you know, a, a Lions offense. But let's get back to, again, something that we did last week, which is we kind of still self-analyze the Lions and try to pick out some X factors and some players that really need to, you know, either play, have a really big game, you know, in order for the Lions to win or just maybe take on a bigger chunk of responsibility um, than what they're maybe used to. So let's start on the offensive side of the football first when we're looking at the Lions. Who in your mind kind of stands out as as a player or a couple players that need to kind of rise to the occasion if the Lions are expecting to take advantage of this Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense? Yeah, for sure, Miko. So when I look at this game and, you know, look, we've studied the film. We've looked at Tampa. We've obviously looked at the Lions all year. Um, it's a bit of a strength on strength matchup, but I really think it's going to be a big day for Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery to, like, come to, you know, come to play because the Lions offensive line that for my money is the best in football. Uh, they've been great all year, uh, despite having, you know, some difficult, you know, difficulties with injuries and just attrition setting in throughout the course of a 17 game season, but they're healthy now. And uh, yeah, I just, I want to see if they can get Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery in a little bit of a rhythm and, serve you know make the running back like a viable threat to tampa because tampa's good at stopping the run too and they want to make you one-dimensional but you allow that to not happen then man i think everything is going to open up offensively don't you yeah i agree and i think that's something to really kind of focus in on because i know there's going to be tampa bay buccaneers fans that are going to talk about how good and how stout they are against the run and trust me like you said we know we looked at the exactly. film and we've seen what makes that defense so tough against the run i think the thing that makes detroit unique one is that this is who Dan Campbell wants to be, right? And if he has the bodies to run the football, he's going to run the football. Like, he doesn't care how good you think you are. He's going to make you prove it on the field. And that was something that we saw even in the first time they played Tampa, where once David Montgomery went down, the Lions didn't just give up on the run. They were just looked at Craig Reynolds and like, well, now you're getting 13 to 15 carries in this game. Having both you know, David Montgomery and Ja available for this game, I think that's going to be a lot of, of, of wear and tear on this Bucks, you know, defensive line. Not saying that they can't handle it, but it's one of those things where you're not going to just be able to, um, you know, I don't think you're going to beat the Lions into submission to where they just stop running the football. You know, in order for that to happen, you know, your offense is going to have to put up a lot of points and it's almost going to have to be out of reach for Detroit to kind of do that. And so, those are two guys I'm right there with you that I think could have a really big game and have a big impact on keeping this offense on schedule. Yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, you look back to the week six matchup, like they didn't abandon the run when they didn't have Ja and, and David Montgomery, right? Like they still gave it to Craig Reynolds, who's a fine back in his own right, but uh, he's not Ja or Monty in terms of, you know, making people miss after contact or running through contact. Like he's a good one cut runner and he's a hell of a pass blocker um, in the backfield that Craig Reynolds is, but yeah, having your full arsenal at your disposal, like the lions will this weekend, you know, assuming Sam Laporta plays is going to be huge. And especially the two, the two headed monster in the, in the backfield, because I think they're right there. If they're not the best, they're among the best uh, duos in the game. Um, you can look at the numbers. They're a big reason. If you haven't watched a lot of Lions football this year and you're coming for, you know, to, to get some information as a Tampa Bay fan, there's a reason the Lions offense has been so damn efficient all year, and it starts with this offensive line and the running game, right? Because they're able to dictate, you know, what defenses are doing to them. It keeps them on your, you know, it keeps you on your toes. Uh, and they can do it in a myriad of different ways. Like Dan Campbell mentioned this week that they're not going to uh, – I'm paraphrasing here, but slam, uh, you know, a sledgehammer against the steel door over and over. They're going to run the ball, but they're mm -hmm. not going to be silly about it. So they're really strong up the middle. Um, but then at the same time, you know, having Levante David and KJ Britt and uh, Devin White makes you, you know, volatile sideline to sideline. They can make plays that way, too, because they're fast. But 
the Lions can do it in a myriad of different ways, man, whether it's zone, gap scheme, counters, uh, wham, trap, they do it all. And uh, it's it, it's a lot to throw at a defense, even one as experienced and as stout as Tampa Bay's, right? Yeah, and I think that's a really good point that you're that you're hitting on right there is, again, it's one thing to be good against the run, which Tampa is. It's a different thing, though, when you have to deal with so many different run styles. It's one thing when, again, you know, like if you're playing a Tennessee Titans and you're playing against a Derrick Henry, like, OK, we're going to have to deal with him mostly running north and south. It's not going to be a lot of like tosses or stretch plays or things of that nature with Detroit. Again, it's not just the fact that they have Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery. It's the fact that both of them can run in a like a variety of run packages. So you can't necessarily cue in on like, oh, well, Jaw's in, so they're going to be running more stretch or sweeps. Like, that's not the case. Jaw is just as capable of running up the middle as, as David Montgomery is and vice versa. He's Monty's just as likely to get a toss play or to get a play where, you know, again, fullback pulling or leading. There's so many different ways that they can start to attack Tampa Bay. And that's what's led to both of these running backs having really successful seasons. Both of them have over 10 touchdowns. Both of them, you know, are averaging over four yards a carry on the season. David Montgomery was able to, you know, crack a thousand yards rushing. Ja was right there with 960 some odd yards rushing. So they're both very explosive. And at the same time, they're also both just very, like they seem to get better as they continue to get more carries, especially David Montgomery. The more you feed him, the better he seems to get as the game kind of wears on. Yeah, Miko, and he's one of those backs that wear on you as you get into the second half, right? Because he is, he's physical, he's built like, you know, just, just tough as nails and is like a bowling ball, like a little, you know, machine on wheels. Um, and then, like your point, Ja, Ja is a better between the tackles runner than any of us gave him credit for coming out of Alabama, man, because, yeah, he's not the biggest, but he'll run through you, he'll run through arm tackles. Um, he's got crazy short area, um, agility and quickness, like makes dudes look stupid. Go look at some Jameer Gibbs highlights. If you haven't watched him at all this year, uh, he's that dude stopping on a dime, making people hurt, you know, not, he hasn't hurt anybody, but they'd be falling. Um, yeah. so yeah, I, it's all there, man. And to your point they it's early in the season, there were maybe some tells when, when Ja was on the field, just because they weren't really treating them the same, but now. There's no tells, man. They can they can do anything with Ja on the field or Demo on the field. They'll have them both on the field at the same time. Sometimes some packages. So, yeah, it's all there for the taking. And I think that's what makes playing against the Lions so difficult. Is personnel doesn't really dictate what they're about to do. Uh, they can hit you with a bunch of different things, and it can be running or throwing the ball. And then you combine that with an offensive line that's very athletic with Panay Sewell, with Frank Ragnar, with Jonah Jackson. Like, not only do you have to deal with running backs that are very versatile, you have to deal with offensive linemen that are just as versatile and aren't just going to be stationary. You have to worry about a Dan Skipper coming in, Jason Cabinda's back. Like, there's a lot that goes into this run game. So I'm right there with you. I think that is one of the bigger X factors when looking at this Lions offense, because if the running game is going, you're putting Jared Goff in more favorable situations. The play action pass starts to work a little bit more. And the Bucks are still going to have to contend with the likes of Amon Ross St. Brown, uh, J-Mo, J. Ray. Like, there's a lot that they're going to have to deal with. with Sam Laporta. If the run game is going, everybody starts to kind of have an easier day, in my opinion, on the offensive side. Yeah, it just helps you stay on schedule. Um, opens the defense up to to get sucked in when they do inevitably go to the play action pass. You know that's when the safeties and linebackers start taking a few more a few whoopsie steps towards the line of scrimmage, and then you have JMO screaming by them, and they're in oh shit mode, right? They're just chasing. So yeah. that's that's the goal. And man, I'm, I'm glad you made the point of the offensive line here. I'm just looking, and obviously PFF isn't the benchmark of everything, but you look at it. Taylor Decker is the 15th best tackle in football per PFF. Jonah Jackson checks in at 41st out of 80. He's played better lately. Frank Ragnow, according to PFF, second best center in football. Graham Glasgow, seventh at guard. Panay Sewell, first at right tackle. So it really is Thanos' gauntlet, man. Like, them dudes, they are, like, the engine that makes this Lions team go. And the fact that we're highlighting Jameer and Monty 
for this is just, you know, it's a, almost a product of them. Like we expect it from them on a game to every game basis. And that might not be fair, but that's the, that's the price of greatness, right? Miko, like we just know the offensive line is what it is. So yeah, go they, kick some ass. Yeah. They know game in and game out that there's a high level of pressure put on them. There's a, there's an expectation that that group is going to deliver above any other group on this football team. And I think they're going to do it once again. Like they, Maybe not exactly like they did in week six, but I think like we've seen them do it for most of this season, that they're just going mm-hmm. to be that stout and that dependable. And it's again, it's a tough task that they're going to have up against this, you know, this Bucks front seven. But all in all, I think you combine, you know, Hank Fraley's coaching with Ben Johnson's offense with Dan Campbell's mentality. I trust that group more than anyone else on this football team. Yeah, all day. And I'm glad I, I always think this, especially towards the end of every year since he's been here. I love Hank Fraley, man. I think that's one of the best uh, offensive line coaches in football. I'm really glad he's in Detroit. And yeah, because, you know, you have to give him a good chunk of the credit in terms of developing these guys like uh, Frank and Panay and, you know, Graham's playing the best, arguably the best season of his uh, career here in here in Detroit on his second go round. So. Yeah, I'm 100% with you. Uh, if, if you Like you said, to make it simple, if, if, if Ja and Monty can get going, it's going to go a long way to ensuring a Lions victory. Yeah, 100%. So moving now to, on to the defensive side of the football, if the, defense, if the offensive line and as well as the, the running backs are a key part on the offensive side, looking at the defense, I have to look at the trenches once, once again. And Aleem McNeil is staring me in the face as like the X factor for that defensive group. I think if Aleem can continue to have the type of season he's been having, obviously, you know, coming off that injury doesn't look to be hampered by it by any stretch. But if he can be a wrecking ball in the middle, both in the run game and in the pass game where he's taken the biggest leap, we're talking once again about an offense that's going to struggle to find rhythm because, again, Aleem's, you know, I think when he was drafted, a lot of people just expected run stuffer because of his size and his measurables. He's developed so much into a a really good pass rusher from the middle, Morgan. Yeah, we heard the stories all offseason, right? Like, you know, you hear it time and time again. You know, this player is in the best shape of their lives, blah, blah, blah. They changed their body. But Aleem really did. You saw it when you got to training camp this year. He's a big boy. He's 6'2", you know, God God only knows. He says 315 on the website, but we don't know. Um, and he was a part of that inaugural draft class by the Lions general manager, Brad Holmes. And uh, him and uh, Levi Onzerike went back to back. And yeah, Leem's just slowly gotten better, man. He's definitely one of the better interior defensive linemen in the game this year. Uh, since he's gotten back from the injury that he suffered, I believe it was in week 13 against New Orleans. Um, had a strong game in Minnesota. Had a hell of a game um, against the Rams in the wild card mm-hmm. round. So. He's definitely ascending, and something we touched on uh, in our offensive, the video that we uh, highlighted the Tampa Bay offense, uh, their interior offensive line isn't the best. Um, Hainsey at center, Malk at uh, right guard, and then uh, Stinney, I believe his name is, at left guard, and they're just not playing that well, um, both in terms of creating running room and protecting Mayfield. And as we know, it's a little bit of a tired football cliche, but Interior pressure is the worst pressure you can deal with as a quarterback, especially if you're not a hyper-athletic or mobile quarterback who can make a ton of throws off platform, right? So, yeah, yeah if, if, if a lean can start wrecking shop in there, you know, that's where so much happens. That's where your edge players like Hutch and Pascal and maybe James Houston are coming up and thanking you because when a player on the inside is disruptive, you sometimes just get gimme sacks as an edge rusher, you know, well, just, and I was it's almost say, like, go ahead. Yeah. You know, no, I was going to say on, on top of that, like when you have strong edge rushers, right. It typically what you want to do as an, as an offense is like, okay, well, we'll slide like, you know, protection to this side to be able to provide more help to, you know, maybe to the side that Hutch is on. Well, when you have a lean McNeil in the middle, you kind of can't do that. You have to be mindful that like, Hey, he's probably going to command a double team as well. And like we know, Morgan, when it comes to, you know, offensive line protection, there's only so many guys that you can double before somebody's going to have a one-on-one or somebody's going to come free. And 
again, it starts with Aleem kind of doing what you're saying, like being a, a menace in the middle so that you make the offense have to make adjustments and based off those adjustments, maybe find themselves a little vulnerable in a different area of that defense. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure Aaron Glenn has started looking this week about like they do it too. They do it quite a bit. Well, they'll stack Aleem and Hutch on the same side, you know, have uh, Aleem at the three technique and then Hutch at the edge on passing downs and you can mix and match, right? And you can kind of create matchups that you want, you know, by alignment to a certain extent, you know, offensive line can, they can slide and they can protect your, to your point, but you can, you can really kind of create and manufacture the matchups you want. So yeah, if I'm Aaron Glenn, I'm trying to get a lean in one-on-ones with some of these guards, maybe get him heads up on the center Hainsey because if Aleem comes to play like he did against the Rams, there's going to be some hell to pay in the middle uh, for Tampa Bay just because he's that kind of player. And the Lions have enough around him that where you can't just, you know, devote bodies to Aleem, right? Like against yeah. – for the Lions, right, they can devote an extra body or two to Vita Vea, okay? Because Tampa Bay is a good defense, but it's they don't really have another – they don't have a star edge rusher or another player next to Vita Vea that are just, you know, creating a ton of havoc, right? So, uh, yeah, it's it's one of those things where you kind of have to pick your poison against the Lions defense. It's not the most talented, but having Hutch and having Aleem on the same defensive line does present some problems for offenses, right? Well, I was going to say, it definitely presents a problem when your offensive line, like you were saying earlier, it doesn't protect well in the begin to begin with, right? We talked about this, like you said, in the video where we broke down the offense. 16 sacks of Baker Mayfield in the last five games. That's not a recipe for success. And so you, again, you combine that with an edge rusher in Hutch, who's one of the top, you know, players in, in generating pressure. You uh, combine that with a defensive tackle like Elaine McNeil, who, again, very quick, very agile, can can definitely create, you know, havoc in the middle after, you know, with this season having, what, five, six sacks on the season. You have those two guys as a tandem, like someone's getting home to 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 Baker Mayfield at some point in time in this game, I I feel like. And when you have someone like Aleem, I think he can definitely be the person to kind of kick that door open for other defensive players on, you know, on Aaron Glenn's defense, whether that's Josh Pascal, whether that's Ifatu Melifanwu, if they decide to do some more secondary blitzes and things of that nature. Like these two players, but specifically Aleem, them having a good game can easily just uh, offer up more opportunities for other teammates. Yeah, and that's that's a lot of the time how it goes being an interior defensive lineman. Sometimes it's not you eating from a statistical standpoint. It's it's your teammates eating because like Vita Vea, um, and again, you have Kalijah Kansi on Tampa Bay too. I didn't want to sh- sell them short. I do like Kalijah Kansi a lot. Um, but yeah, you know, you... Yeah, it's it all starts there, right? If you can create interior pressure, if Aleem can can wreck shop and just create a little bit of mayhem in the offensive backfield, then it's just going to go a long way to like what we talked about, just making Mayfield uncomfortable uh, in the pocket and not letting him just hit that back foot and rip it. That's what we don't want, uh, yeah. because like we like we saw in our offensive preview video, that's where he's at his best when there's not a whole lot of you know thinking or you know process out of structure it's just bam i'm hitting the back of my drop and i'm ripping that thing so yeah getting getting a lean going i think is a catalyst to get the rest of the defense going because to your point miko if a lean is playing well um against the run especially then it leaves room for anzalone jack campbell Derek barnes you know the linebackers to run free and, and make plays and that would be really critical too to our point earlier just making them one-dimensional um, you know, and then there you're just, you're off and running in terms of, you know, being on defense, in my opinion, because while Tampa Bay's, you know, skill, skill guys are nice, like we talked about, mm-hmm. if you're just defending the pass, it makes it quite a bit easier um, in terms of stopping somebody. Well, I was going to say, if you're just defending the pass or if you're an offense that is heavily reliant on big plays, this becomes much more difficult if a defensive line is, you know, again, manhandling your offensive line. Things are going to start yeah. speeding up a lot quicker than than you're used to them. And we'll have to see if Baker Mayfield can make those quick reads and make those quick adjustments to still be able to get the ball to his playmakers. But like you said, if you're getting pressure in the middle, the likelihood of that happening starts to decline fairly rapidly. Yeah, and it just 
it just creates such a problem for your offense, right? Because there's just nowhere for the quarterback to step up. And it's, again, it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but there's a reason you hear coaches and everyone, you know, football people in general talk about, you know, you don't want pressure up the middle. You yeah. know, off the edge, you can handle it. You can step up, you can evade somebody, reset your feet. But yeah, if it's right up the middle, whew, it's going to be tough. And from a matchup standpoint, it does look good on paper for the Lions, just in terms of a lean versus that offensive, that interior offensive line. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to throw one more X factor in here with you, Morgan, and then we're going to get out of here. And that has to be the home crowd, right? We saw it against the Rams. We saw how what kind of impact that had specifically, again, on the defensive side of the football where, you know, the Rams had to burn two timeouts late in that game when they really kind of probably would have needed them in the fourth quarter, but had to burn them in the third quarter. So, again, on top of the running backs playing well, on top of Aleem having a really strong performance, Lions fans that are going to be in attendance at Ford Field, if they can continue to be, you know, that type of impact where, you know, they're loud and they're disrupting what the Bucks' offense is capable of doing, Again, it's just another thing that tips, you know, things more so in the Lions' favor. Yeah, and make no mistake about it. Um, for those of y'all that don't know or are newer to the channel, I'm a I've been a season ticket holder a long time, and uh, yeah, man, that was the most electric atmosphere I've ever been in last week. My voice is still recovering. We're we're recording this Friday night, and my voice is just, like just now getting back to normal. And I plan on doing the same thing on Sunday. I hope all you guys are that are going. We need to turn up. Like Saint said, he, I think Saint Brown said he heard about it being like 133 decibels. He's like, I want 140. So, hey man, for it. We're talking. We're in the playoffs now. It's winter. Go home. I get it. I get it. People, your throats are probably like Morgan said. Your throats are probably just now recovering. The the team needs you. So, I mean, again, I think that's another big X factor for this game. So if they go out there and they're disruptive and they're constantly, you know, again, just making it difficult for that Bucks offense. Again, I'm trying to, like, again, we know football is, is so weird in that way that literally it is any given Sunday. But it's hard not to feel confident as the Lions when you start to kind of break things down, both offensively, defensively. You take into consideration home field, special teams. This feels like a game where the Lions should be very confident and they should walk into this game as such. But at the end of the day, we all know it all comes down to executing on the field. For sure, Miko. And it's the NFL. Like we're not, you know, we're not being overly confident just because it's just like there's a reason the Lions are almost a touchdown favorite in terms of, you know, betting odds. But anything can happen. And the Lions have shown us if they don't come ready to play, it's the NFL. So you can, you know, lose any given Sunday to your point. But yeah, it's the same like with the Rams. You know, they the Lions scored a bunch of times early, and the crowd just got more and more amped. Man, it was and the, the discipline is really good. They would they would shut up on offense. You could hear a pin drop damn near, and then mm-hmm. on defense, it was so loud, man. And then when Stafford would try to go check the play, they would turn up the volume a little bit more. Um, and they did a good job. Like Alex Anzalone said, he wanted the fans to start getting loud when they're in the huddle. We did that the whole time. Uh, so yeah, that it's definitely a factor. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I've never been to, I've been to Tampa Bay stadium, but it, it was when I was like eight and it was yeah. the NFC central. They were wearing the cream sickles. That's all I remember. And Barry went crazy. <laughs> That's all I really remember. But, um, but yeah, man, I, I definitely anticipate the crowd to be a factor again this Sunday. They know what's at stake. Um, so yeah, I'm, I can't wait because that, as soon as you walked in, it was just charged, man. It just felt like there was legit, like, electric like electric energy in the air and it was crazy yeah and so i'm right there with you i'm expecting the same type of environment if not more this upcoming week so listen that's gonna do it for this video those are our x factors you have jameer gibbs david montgomery uh aline mcneil and then of course you the fans who are going to be in attendance at the game if you guys bring your energy if the players bring their best performance I think the Lions have a really good chance of coming out on top of this one. So let us know what you guys think. Do you guys have a specific X factor on both offense or defense that you're kind of singling out that we didn't mention? Let us know that in the comment section. Also, like always, head over to prideofdetroit.com. Check out all the latest articles that are being uploaded. Uh, the guys over there are putting together some really good content for you. So please be go, make sure that you go over there and support them. And last but not least, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. That way you can be notified anytime we upload new videos or anytime we decide to go live over here on YouTube. So with all that said, 
I'm Miko. He's Morgan. Thank you guys for taking the time to watch. And we'll catch you guys in the next one.